right. What are the odds that I kick one of these candles inadvertently while I'm preaching, huh? Anybody? Five dollars? I see five dollars. Hey, if you, uh, if you didn't get your uh, communion elements on the way in, make sure you go out and get those uh, for the folks in your family at least because we're going to be sharing communion at the end of the uh, sermon here in just a few minutes. And uh, I don't know if you've been by to see the lights at night around here yet, but uh, every night at about five o'clock, the front of the, uh, all of the church and all the buildings is kind of Clark, Clark W. Griswolded out. So bring, bring your friends, and there's a radio station you can tune to, and there's signs out there. And hopefully you got those merry and bright cards, and you're going to be inviting folks. We've got reindeer games happening outside this Wednesday night. We had a Christmas party last week. And it's just been a lot of fun. So uh, we're, we're talking about joy, and I want to kick it off with a video from one of my Christmas favorites, one of my favorite Christmas movies, and uh, we'll go from there. But uh, watch, watch the screens and revel in the awesomeness. Here we go. Sam. The movie Elf, come on. I, I'm going to tell you, um, you need to see it before Christmas season is over. It's so fantastic. My favorite part of the scene, the whole thing there, is when everybody just watches them screaming. It just, it just keeps going. They're like, ah. Man, we can pick out a fake, can't we? You can pick it out. You, you can smell it. You can sense it. You know when somebody has put on a mask and they're faking. We're not good at faking. In the Bible times, in the times of Jesus, people that faked things were called actors. As you can see, it has changed so much to this day. But back in the Bible times, in the, in the whole province and, and, and in the, in the Greco-Roman times, the, the actors would carry around a bag of masks. And the masks they would put on depending on what emotion the character was playing. So if the character was happy, they would put on a happy mask. If the character was angry, it would be a rage mask. And they, they got really skilled at the art of multi-masking because the actors, you know what they were called in the Greek, hypocrites. That's where we get our word hypocrite from, where you're pretending to be something that you're not. Jesus had a lot to say about people who were faking it, who were masking their lives. Jesus said things like, don't show one thing when you're really feeling another or when you're really doing another thing. Jesus said, don't be a hypocrite. Don't be an actor or an imposter. And so many of us are really good at wearing the happy mask. Like a department store Santa who smells like beef and cheese and isn't the real Santa, some of us play the game that we're happy all the time. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I think, especially at Christmas, we feel this pressure 
to just act like things are happy all the time. Happy, 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 happy. And can I tell you something? Faking it is the fuel that drives a crazy life. Faking it is the fuel that will drive your life crazy. When, when you refuse to allow your authentic self to be real or to come out and play. Now, granted, there are, there are some moments where we do have to compartmentalize because, you know, everybody at the office, they do not deserve to enter into my therapy session, nor should they come in to my therapy session. I am not, I am not supposed to go out and bleed all my feelings on all the people unsuspectingly. But we're also not created to keep everything in, to keep the stuff up our lip, to never cry, to never feel bad things. In fact, there's a whole book in the Bible called Lamentations where the people are lamenting. Those aren't happy things. That's sadness. I've always found it really odd when I'm around certain folks at the holidays especially, whether it's Christmas or Thanksgiving. And I know that they're having a hard time, but they have got this smile like burned on them. And they're not going to show any weakness. They're never going to let us see them cry. It's also pretty sad. Because if we can't be human, if we can't live authentically, if we have to always put a mask on because we're afraid what somebody else may think or say or do, we're missing out on being human. And happiness is not the theme of Advent. It's not, happiness is, is not the coming of Christ into the world, but joy is. Joy is different from happiness. Joy says, even when everything else is going kaput, I'm going to be okay because I have hope and faith in something greater than the things around me. That's the promise we read about today from the text in Isaiah, when Michaela was talking about the promise of Jesus being a rallying banner. Raised high for everyone to see. That joy, this sense of being okay, this sense of having greater hope than greater despair. This joy flows freely. So let's talk about joy. Let's talk about the promise of Jesus that grows in our life. This promise is filled with hope, not condemnation. When we, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I think of the church, or I think about growing up in church, or I think about church people, or I think about... Stanley County, sometimes I, I hear more shoulds than promises of hope. What do I mean? Well, it sounds like this. Well, you should have done that. You should have done this. You should have done this. If you'd have just done this, it's like we have this critical parent in our life, known as, known as the community or people around us, that are just telling us what we should have done and things wouldn't be said. You know how much that helps me when I'm going through the ringer? Like, None at all. The shoulds need to stay the should out of here, okay? They need to go far, far away. I don't want to hear the shoulds when I'm dealing with the pain. Here's what the joy of Jesus does. The joy of Jesus doesn't come to me through prayer or through worship or through scripture. It gives me a lot of shoulds. Well, if you had just been better, if you had just thought better, acted better, what? no, no, no. The joy of Jesus growing in me does different things. And we can thank the coming of Jesus as a babe in Bethlehem for the joy that comes from Jesus. Here's what the joy of Jesus does. It replaces my busyness with affection. Say that with me. I'm replacing busyness with affection. That's what the joy of Jesus does. Now, we live in a time and place where busyness is seen as like a, such a strong value of importance. If you want to see who the important people are, it's the ones running around so, so busy. But those of us who are running around so, so busy, how many of us want a nap? Not a one of us. Wow. Okay. Three, four, five, okay. How many of us are sick of running around? So I don't think being busy is a sign of importance or promise or blessing. 
I don't think that a sign of busyness is actually a sign of anything that God gives us at all. In fact, when I look at the days of creation, when I look at the Ten Commandments, when I look at the promises of Scripture, there's not a command there to keep myself busy. Now, there's words there about hard work and not being lazy. But busy, this incessant drive that every moment of every day has to be efficient and productive or I'm not any good. You know what busyness does? Busyness, it tricks me into believing that what I do is more important than who I am. What I can do matters more than who God's making me to be. And you know what the joy of Jesus does? The joy of Jesus takes our busyness and it replaces it with affection. I want to read from scripture out of the book of Matthew and the, about the coming of Jesus and the birth of Jesus. Here's what it says, starting in verse 1. Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea during the reign of King Herod. He was the bad guy, by the way. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. Now, how am I getting affection out of that? Here's the thing. When you travel to see your friends or your family over the holidays, over Christmas, over the weeks in December, and if you're going a long, long way away, it's an act of affection to spend time together. It's very affectionate. And for these wise men, these wise men from the far eastern lands, think Mongolia, think China, think, think, think Eastern Asia, think India, think, you know, somewhere out in all that stuff, Nepal. I want to imagine that they're from Nepal and, and they left, you know, Everest Base Camp to come all the way out to Israel. You know, that's just my stupid imagination. It took great affection to start stop and to go giving your time and travel giving your time giving yourself paying for the trip out rich educated important people from far away not going on a vacation and those of you who spent time with family over thanksgiving know that was not a vacation that was family time there is a difference between family time and vacation can i get an amen from all yeah thank you i love my family but vacation is a beach and not looking at the clock and you know not working family time is important it's actually filled with more affection family time because we make concessions to be with each other. We, we let our preferences go and we put up with each other in the same house. Because we want to be together. These wise people from the east were making this pilgrimage to see the Christ child. It reminds me of a trip that, that I took uh, a few years ago with my buddy Joseph. I think there's a picture of me and Joseph. Uh, yeah, there we are. We're standing outside the first. That's Joseph on the right there if you're confused as to which one is Joseph and which one is me. Joseph is on the right here in the picture. Do we? Okay, we're good. So we're standing outside of the First Presbyterian Church in Kalispell, Montana, because Joseph and I have a mutual mentor, pastor, person that we love dearly who had died. And we made the trip to Montana just for this guy's funeral. And we, we were both incredibly moved because this was not just going to a funeral for us. This was us showing affection to someone we dearly loved and remembering. And if somebody close to you has passed, even recently, you know that that funeral, you know that that memorial, you know that that time of remembering was more about saying goodbye. And it was probably really hard. Some of us, we, we go and we show support to the people who are grieving. In, in this instance with Joseph, we were grieving. And we, we I, I'll tell you, like, I, we, were, we were living in Baltimore at the time, and I flew out on a Friday to Denver, flew into Missoula, drove the three hours into Kalispell, went to the funeral, went back, took a red eye all the way home that night from, from Montana back to Baltimore, 
walked in my living room, laid down on the couch for like 30 minutes, then went to church and, and preached multiple times. Like, it was worth it to go and risk it and to go without sleep because there was great affection. Affection is tied to a pilgrimage like that. Affection is like one of the only things that will snap us out of our busy lives. Think about it. What would cause you to snap out of your work schedule or your every day? It would most likely be the death of someone very close to you or the suffering of someone very close to you. Nothing else matters in those moments. There's great affection that is shown. And let me tell you something, busyness will snap and steal your joy away. It will cause you to be desensitized to affection. The everyday grind, if you don't check it, and if you don't submit it to God, the everyday grind will suck the affection out of your life. Joy is closely tied to the affection you give and the affection you receive. Some of us have a really difficult time receiving gifts or receiving love. Can I tell you something? Me too. I want to get better at it. I was watching this television program, and I don't even remember what the show was, but this, I think it was a king in the program, received a gift from someone. And they gave him the gift. It was flowers or something. I don't know what it was. But he took the gift, and he goes, for me? And this little kid goes, yeah. Thank you. He just received the gift. He didn't heme and haw and say, oh, I'm a king, I don't need your gift. Oh, I'm an adult and you're a kid, I'm good. Oh, how cute, pats on the head. No, 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 no. This important, important person, he didn't need the gift, but he received the gift. Some of us, I think that your receiving of a gift might just be part of the healing that you experience. And that's for me too, because the grind of every day will make us feel like we're not worthy of receiving gifts. I don't deserve it, or I'm not good enough. Jesus is God's greatest gift to you. It's God's affectionate, loving response to you. Remember what we read from this prophecy earlier. Fear of God. Fear of God will be all his joy and delight. He won't, be, he won't judge by appearances. He won't ju judge based on what he sees with his eyes. He won't decide based on the basis of hearsay. He won't judge just by what he hears. He'll judge the needy by what is right, render decisions on earth's poor with justice. His words will bring everyone to all attention. He's not going to judge with a bunch of shoulds. A mere breath from his lips will topple the wicked. Each morning he'll put on a sturdy work clothes and boots and build righteousness and faithfulness in the land. Those of us that are blue-collar workers, we like that kind of talk. He puts, on his, he puts on his sturdy work clothes because he is going to work hard for righteousness and justice and faithfulness in the land. How does he do that? He does it every time you put on those coveralls, man. Because he's with you. He does it every time that you walk into the office because he's with you. You are bringing the justice and the righteousness of Jesus. You are the work clothes of Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are the love and the compassion and the joy of Jesus. You're walking in because you have a message. You have something important, and it's the joy of the Lord. So hug the kids a little bit tighter next time, okay? Snuggle them a little bit longer. Make time and make margin in your heart for the affection that God gives to you. Maybe today, sing a little louder. Because the joy of Jesus is yours. That's one of the biggest first ways I see that the joy of Jesus has, an, has a direct effect. And this, he's replacing our busyness with affection. Here's the second thing. I'm replacing indifference with wonder. Say this with me. I'm replacing indifference with wonder. It's a prophetic claim. I'm going to replace indifference with wonder. Look at what scripture says. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this. He was deeply disturbed when he heard why the wise men were coming from the east. As, as was everyone in Jerusalem. See, we, 
we like to blame Herod for a lot of things, and he was the bad guy, really bad guy. But who else was disturbed? Everybody. Everybody was disturbed. You got these foreign guys coming in, wanting to worship a new king. Yeah, there's, 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 some, there's some policy we need to rewrite here. How did they get in? He called a meeting. Herod called a meeting of the lead priests and the teachers of the religious law. And he asked them this question. Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? So the king brought in all the religious people. And he said, where, where is this baby going to be born? In Bethlehem of Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Remember, everybody's disturbed. Everybody's upset. Now, King Herod's response is the response of a crazy, jealous maniac. If you read on in Scripture what happens, Herod declares the death of the firstborn. The de- not the firstborn, the death of any kid that had been born recently under the age of two. Genocide. That's what the maniac decreed. Genocide. Every baby boy. So imagine all the baby boys that you know in life, if you were living in the time of Herod, if you were living in this kingdom, they would be killed by royal decree. That's what crazy maniacs do. That's what happens when all of your wonder is gone. Herod only saw threat. He didn't see the words from Isaiah like we see them, where the lion will eat the grain like the goat, or the kid, the baby, will play at the den of a cobra. Those are bizarre thoughts, that there would be such peace and such joy and such harmony that these things would coexist. No, Herod didn't, Herod, Herod had no wonder. Herod had fear and he had threat. And he responded like somebody threatened and backed into a corner. You may want to write this down. A life that is focused on maniacs will lead you to maniacal living. If you focus your life on the fear and the threats and the bad things in life, it will cause you to do the things that maniacs do. I've said this for years when I've preached. I could care less who your favorite cable news outlet is. I could care less if you get your news from YouTube, Yahoo, Facebook, or your next door neighbor. I could care less what app you enjoy to catch up on current events. Here's what I would challenge you with. However much time you're putting into figuring out and seeing the ways of the world through whatever lens, put at least that much time into Scripture. Because here's what I'm going to tell you. Your Scripture time is going to be so much more healthy for you than the time dedicated to this stuff over here. This stuff over here, and I don't, this, this is nonpartisan. This, is, this has nothing to do with who you vote for or what you like to listen to. I don't care what the media outlet is. It's driven around fear. It's driven around threats. It's driven around a crazy, jealous, me-centered world. And you know what's even worse? Some of these media outlets like to take the adjective Christian and put them on top of them, as if they are now sanitized fear mongers. Yeah, I'll say it. Christian is a terrible adjective and a fantastic noun. Christian is a terrible adjective and a fantastic noun. This is not a Christian shirt. This is a Christian wearing a shirt. That is not Christian news. That is news that is being listened to and written by Christians. Maybe. If you focus on maniacal, fear-mongering, threat-ridden stuff, it's going to lead you 
to that kind of living. And I want to draw your attention to the people in the background in the scripture. In the court of the king, the religious people who were in the court of the king, I want to draw your attention to the preachers and the priests and the teachers. The crazy king comes to them with his question. They knew why he was asking this question. Herod had a track record of being crazy and maniacal and jealous. What do they do? They do what they do so that they don't have his ire turned toward them. They answer his question. Well, the baby's going to be born in Bethlehem. The baby's, the, the, the baby's going to be born from the tribe of Benjamin. Notice what Herod does. Herod takes that information, and, and if you read in Scripture, he makes a blanket decree. He doesn't make it just for Bethlehem, just for Judea, just for the, the, the tribe of Benjamin. He, he, does, he, he, does, he doesn't make it for the tribe of Judah. He makes, it, he makes it for all of the kingdom. Genocide. That's what crazy kings do. This is what happens when indifference takes over and we have no space for wonder. There was no space in Herod's life for there to be another king. There was no space in Herod's life for there to be any salvation aside from what he could bring. There was no space in Herod's life for there to be someone greater than him. But you know what wonder will do? Wonder will make you affectionate. Wonder will make you take the pilgrimage and ask the questions. Wonder will make you hopeful. Wonder will flicker inside and cause you to be more hungry and more driven to what God is saying than the mouths of the creation. That's what wonder will do. But indifference, indifference, granted, you're not, nobody here is a maniacal, crazy king, okay? I don't look around here and I don't, I don't even look in our county and see somebody that wants to kill a bunch of, of newborn babies. Like, I, I don't see that. That is crazy, okay? But here's what indifference will do to us. It'll put you on the couch for hours staring at a screen, indifferent from the life that's happening all around you. It'll block you from seeing the kids growing up. It'll block you from seeing the family around you. It'll block you from seeing the hope that could be. It'll make you walk through life feeling like everything hopeful is just silly. Indifference causes a jeweler to sit down with millions of dollars worth of gems and diamonds and to polish them and treat them as though they are just rocks. But there's no beauty there. There's no significance there. The jeweler is no longer humbled by the beauty and ends up seeing the sacred like they're a pair of old worn out boots. You know what? It isn't what's bigger and more expensive and what is more beautiful that causes us to have feeling that lasts. Some of us have been around beauty for a long time, but indifference has creeped in and we don't even see beauty anymore. Wonder makes you see beauty again. Wonder gives you hope again. Sure, expensive and bigger are cool. Don't get me wrong. I, I drive an 09 Sierra. I'd love to have one of those new ones, you know, that are like more than most of our salaries, you know. <laughs> yeah, give it, give it. Yeah, I love them. Don't get me wrong. But even the richest among us, they often lose their wonder at the shiny new things. I'm going to say it a different way. Wonder is what keeps a faithful prayer warrior praying prayers of faith in a society that is just ripe and pregnant with evil. Those prayer warriors, just they're, they're, they're praying because they just don't know what God's going to do next. They're excited for it. So here's the prayer. God, stir our imaginations. And finally, I can see the joy of Jesus growing in me every time I replace something fake with something real. Say it with me. I'm replacing fake with real. Say it again louder. I'm replacing fake with real. Then Herod called for a private meeting, starting in verse 7, with the wise men. And he learned from them the time 
from the time when the star first appeared, and he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so I can worship them too. Total hypocrisy, total fake, because what did Herod do? He ended up killing so many, many babies. But he came back to the wise men with, with a lying, hypocritical activity. That is the method of a maniac. That is the method of a maniac murdering, baby-killing king. We talked at length about how faking it will drive us into a crazy life. Think about this scene from the beginning that we watched earlier with the fake Santa. That's a funny description. It was a funny scene. But our masks take on deeper meaning. There's another scene from this movie, Elf, that I think is brilliant because you can spot the fake immediately. It's not the same scene. But you can spot when somebody's being fake and the mask is being worn. And you can, you can literally find the moment when the mask is taken off and put down and that person just opens up their, their heart. And, and this beautiful heartwarming scene towards the end. I want you to watch this scene. Look for the moment where the mask is dropped. See if you can find it. Gonna list, checking it twice. Gone. It reminds me sometimes of singing in church. <laughs> we'll be singing like, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here, like we were singing earlier. And I feel like my kids looked at me before and been like, you're just mouthing the words. Man, when I open up my heart, 
and I just worship him. When I open up my heart, when I move from something half-hearted to being wholehearted, it changes everything. Sometimes I'm just going through the motions and doing it. And you know what? I get it. Sometimes I don't have the capacity or the... I'm just fatigued and I'm worn down, you know? But here's the great thing about like us being together in a place called church like this. Is that my half-heartedness can sometimes be met by your wholeheartedness. And it matters. Sometimes all I've got is just like the the stamina or the interest to say, yeah, I need prayer. Pray for me. And then I feel the hands and the warmth of the people of God's family coming around me, reminding me again that he's good, reminding me again that my indifference can be replaced with wonder, reminding me again that my busyness can be replaced with affection, that my idea of just going through life with a mask and faking it can be replaced by something that's authentic and real. And for some of us today, I think it's just time that we start singing again. And I mean that like in a big way, not just in a momentary kind of thing. Like I think for some of us, it's time that, that we push our cynicism aside And just like the little video of the guy who's singing with his kids about Santa, we can raise the expectation level from Santa to a God who loves us, who gave his son, who died and rose again, to a God who has all things for our good, who redeems our sin and redeems our pain. For a God who takes our journeys and our suffering, and he doesn't promise that it will be taken away. What he does promise is that he'll be with us and that he will bring redemption and resurrection through it. He will bring purpose to the pain. That's what he promises. And with that kind of promise, how can we not have joy? How can we not be full of hope? How how can we not see a good God? I'll tell you what, your busyness will cause you to miss him. Your indifference and your cynicism will cause you to miss him. And this activity of wearing masks and being fake will cause you to miss him. All of those things are the actions of a crazy, maniacal King Herod. And you ain't called to be no Herod. You were not called to live in the chaos and the maniac world of Herod the Great. Or Herod the Son. Or Herod the Fourth. You were called as a son, as a daughter of the Most High King. Loved. Cherished. Part of his church. You know what he does with crazy maniacal kings? He resurrects from the dead. Will you stand with me? I want us to pray and then I want us to share in communion together. There's some of us here today that would say, Nate, I'm, I am in danger of indifference. I'm in danger of like this whole cynicism. I'm in danger of like busyness and just being fake, like robbing me from God's best. Maybe maybe you would say even, you know what? I, I, I'm not even following Jesus and I need to make that right. With everybody's heads bowed, everybody's eyes closed. If you need to make things right with God, just right now is your moment. All together we're praying, dear Jesus. All together we're praying. That means you pray loudly after me. Dear Jesus. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for your joy. Thank you for coming to this earth and for saving me. I believe you. You died. You rose from the dead. And I can access joy now. Because you give me wholehearted life. And I receive it. Thank you. If you have those communion elements, I want you to take them out. 
you peel back the first layer, you can pull the bread out. So do that and pull out the bread. We share this meal for a couple reasons. One, because Jesus commanded his church, every time you get together and you eat this bread and you drink from this cup, remember me. So out of obedience, we're sharing this meal. But out of prophetic expectation, we're putting it in our bodies. And we're welcoming God's Holy Spirit. We're welcoming everything that this meal represents into our lives. This bread represents the broken body of Jesus. Broken, beaten, by his stripes we are healed. By his broken body. He said, take this, eat it. And remember me. Let's eat together. And then we take this cup. And we, out of obedience, drink from it. But out of prophetic expectation. We put into our very bodies the lifeblood of Christ. The covenant that says you are a son and a daughter adopted in. The salvation of Jesus Christ is yours. You no longer have to wonder if redemption is your future. You have the lifeblood of Jesus Christ in you. And we drink from this cup out of obedience and expectation. And we remember Christ. We're going to sing this last chorus. Take a few minutes. Don't rush it. But just be in his presence. Remember his sacrifice. And declare that the joy of God is yours.